All right, so thanks everyone for coming to my session today. Um, my name is Leanne Cho, and I'm currently an MD-PhD student at the University of British Columbia. And I'm a fifth year student in the program. So making my way through this long eight year program, which is the total length. Um, and today I'm excited to share with you about suicidal ideation, substance use and complex concurrent disorders, learning from Vancouver's downtown east side hotel study. Um, and I'll talk about the hotel study and some findings from the work that I've been doing as well as our group overall. Okay, so before launching into the topic itself, I'd like to acknowledge that I live and work on the traditional and unceded territories of the Squamish, Tsleil-Waututh, and Musqueam nations. Um, this work is not directly related to Indigenous health, but I do hope that our work and our work as a collective um, can contribute to repairing the relationship between settlers and these communities. Hey, so this is the agenda for today. Um, I'll start off with some background, some of the work that's been done in this area, and then launch into the hotel study and some specifics about that. Um, I'll then discuss some general findings from the hotel study as, and then before jumping into the depressive symptoms and suicidal ideation data that we have. Then I plan to sum up the main takeaways and name some future directions, and then we should have plenty of time for discussion afterward. Okay, so starting with some background. Um, so with the hotel study and the work that my group has been doing, we've been focusing on those who have experienced homelessness or precarious housing. Uh, homelessness in Canada um, has been a topic for a while and continues to be. To start off, I'd like to define homelessness as being without stable, safe, permanent, or appropriate housing, or the immediate prospect means and ability of acquiring it. Back in 2016, between 150,000 and 300,000 Canadians experienced homelessness. And for reference, at that time, the population of Canada was 36 million. Now it's increased to 38 million, and accordingly, the number of people experiencing homelessness has increased as well, which is the trend globally. Um, and many studies, one of which is the seminal at home Chez Soi study, um, which ran from 2009 to 2013, was a study done by the Mental Health Commission of Canada in five Canadian cities. Um, and it was a clinical trial that assigned people based on need to different interventions. Um, including housing first, where housing was provided to these individuals. And some of the main findings, findings was that first, housing first is effective at addressing homelessness. And second, individuals that experience homelessness face a variety of health and social challenges. Regarding the health challenges, mental health is one of the major areas and one that we'll be focusing on today. So in the Vancouver site of the at-home study, they found that 40% of participants had major depression, 60% had substance dependence, and 53% had psychotic disorder. From the at-home study, as well as a systematic review and meta-analysis, um, and another study of multiple countries, found that lifetime suicidal ideation in homeless populations is up to 41.6% and lifetime suicidal attempt is up to 28.8%. Compared to the general population where these rates are in the single digits, um, that is quite a big difference. So that speaks to the um, comparatively higher rate of suicidality in this population and hints at how more support is needed for this condition. Hey, zooming back into the province that um, we're in, in Vancouver, or in British Columbia, um, we have a high rate of folks who live in homelessness or precarious housing in a neighborhood called the downtown east side. This is a figure here from the Vancouver Coastal Health Authority that shows the mortality rate in the downtown east side and compared to the different neighborhoods um, in the lower mainland. And we can see from this red here that the premature mortality rate is above four, and it's the higher standardized mortality rate in the region. Some other facts and figures 
Um, so this neighborhood is home to about 10,000 people. Mental illness is in about 40%. Um, and when we look at addiction specifically, have about 4,700 injection drug users. And the mortality is about 10 times that of the rate of BC. Uh, for some common medical conditions, HIV is present in about 30% of people, HCV in 70%. And uh, as for causes of premature mortality, some of the major ones include HIV AIDS and tuberculosis. Okay, in the downtown east side, people live in a variety of places. So uh, one of the major places is in subsidized housing units, otherwise known as single room occupancy hotel buildings. Almost 4,000 units are there. Other places include emergency shelters with about 272, recovery centers a little bit less. There's also market housing options and privately owned buildings, um, a little bit more than uh, 4,500. And the estimate of people with living, living with mental illness and or addiction totals to almost 70%. In this neighborhood, um, given the population there, there's also quite a bit of existing support advocacy and community as well. So I don't want to, um, so I want to talk about that as well. Some of the existing substance use supports are safe injection sites. So Insight is actually the first safe injection site in North America. And then Crosstown Clinic also does innovative treatments as well for substance use disorders. There's advocacy groups such as the Vancouver Area Network of Drugs Users, and this is a picture from their website. There are social enterprises such as the ones listed here that um, aim to teach skills and to those living on disability and these businesses um, practice sustainability and give back to the community. Um, and then finally, creative outlets are a major endeavor as well um, with art galleries such as the Gallery Gachet, Vancouver Downtown East Side Artist Collective and murals all over the neighborhood as well. And this one here um, was actually designed um, alongside our group in the hotel study with a local artist named Jesse Gauchi as part of our knowledge translation initiative. Okay, so zooming in further, um, now going into the hotel study, which um, has now been um, active since 2008 and involves a whole host of faculty members and students. Um, the person who started it was Dr. Bill Honer, William Honer, who is my PhD supervisor. And the objective of this study is to focus on those living in single room occupancy hotels in the neighborhood to determine how they came to be there with their co-occurring illnesses. And we also sought a clear understanding of the capabilities of those afflicted with those complex illnesses and to identify targets for intervention. So some other facts about the study are that it's longitudinal, it's prospective, and it's observational, and it's situated in the downtown east side neighborhood. Recruitment took place in waves um, in different cohorts that took place between 2008 and the most recent cohort enrolled in 2017. And participants were recruited from single room occupancy hotels, the downtown community court, and St. Paul's emergency department. The study is community-based, so our study office is down in the neighborhood, and participants were not selected for any medical or psychiatric condition in particular, and assessments are monthly um, and include a whole host of questionnaires, um, interview with a psychiatrist every year, um, and uh, so on. So these are some general sample demographics. At this point, we have 538 participants enrolled that come for monthly assessments. The mean age is 31 with the range of 20 to 68. The gender breakdown is mostly men, 22% uh, women and less than 1% identify as transgender. The ethnicity breakdown is 60% white, 26% indigenous and other is 14%. A little less than half of the group has completed grade 12 or the equivalent education. 75% has experienced past homelessness. 
and there's a high rate of healthcare services use as well. So those who had a visit with a family physician in the first six months of study entry was 84%. Hey, so these figures are from one of the hotel study papers that came out in 2017 and shows that downtown Eastside residents visit St. Paul's Hospital more for substance use and mental health reasons compared to other neighborhoods. So similar to the figure from the Health Authority, we have an area map of Vancouver and its surrounding neighborhoods. And over here in the circle is the downtown Eastside area. Um, and red represents this um, highest number category. Um, on the left here um, shows those who were admitted for substance use concerns and on the right for mental health. Okay, another uh, early study from the hotel study showed that high mortality in the downtown east side is due to treatable illnesses. So in the first uh, six or I guess 3.8 years of follow-up, um, there were three 371 participants enrolled in the study, and it was found that the strongest predictors of mortality were psychosis and liver disease related to hepatitis C. So while in the general population among this number of people, the expected deaths were five people, the actual death was close to 40. And as of present, with over 500 people enrolled now, we have now had unfortunately 101 people who have deceased with six that have withdrawn contempt, 101 lost a follow-up. So some notable numbers here are that 30 people uh, died from an accidental overdose, 32 from unknown causes, and there was only one co confirmed case of suicide. And these, uh, this information is from coroner's reports that uh, we received after they were completed. Okay, so with those general findings um, described, I'll now move into talking about depression and suicidal ideation in our study. So first, how was it assessed? So depression and suicidality was assessed by self-report in the hotel study. Depressive symptoms were, well, both of them were assessed with the same self-report questionnaires. The first was the, de the Beck depression inventory which is a 21-item self self-report questionnaire um, that uh, items are rated on a Likert scale of how often somebody endorses each symptom, and it's split up into four different severity categories. And then the second questionnaire was the Modsley Addiction Profile um, Depression Subscore, which is a five-item self self-report questionnaire. The Modsley was created in a context um, where everybody had a substance use disorder. And, um, and so that was part of why that questionnaire was selected. Suicidal ideation was assessed with one item from each of these. So the BDI item um, ranged from zero to three. And you can see here um, what the different um, item levels were that people identified with. And then the Modsley addiction profile was a little bit more simple. So how often have you experienced the following emotional or psychological symptom for the suicidality item? Um, it was phrased as thoughts of ending your life um, on a scale of zero to four. And in our study, suicidal ideation was defined when a participant had at least one on the BDI and two on the Modsley. Okay, so at baseline, these were the rates of depression and suicidal ideation in our study. For the BDI total score, the median score was 13 with a range of 6 to 22. And over here are the rates of the different score categories with most people having minimal depressive symptoms and uh, fewer and fewer um, as we go up the severity levels. At baseline, 12% had suicidal ideation and 13% had major depressive disorder. And MDD was um, diagnosed by a psychiatrist uh, of our study. So not self-report. 
Okay, so before using these assessment tools to look at the relationships between depression, suicidality, and other factors in our study, we first want to know, is this a helpful tool to use? Um, so we conducted a psychometric analysis and found that BDI scores have high validity, sensitivity to change, and reliability. So over here is the da data that um, showed convergent validity. We did a correlation between BDI scores and the Maudsley depression subscores um, with the Maudsley depression subscore as a so-called gold standard given the sample that it was created with and found there was a high correlation. So this gives us confidence that the BDI is assessing depressive symptoms fairly. With sensitivity to change, we defined two different groups in our study. The first was those who had a major depressive episode at baseline that remained at the one-year follow-up, and the group that had a resolved MDE were those who had an MDE at baseline that uh, resolved at the one-year follow-up. And so as we can see with this figure here, those who had a persistent MDE, their BDI scores did not change very much. However, in those who had a resolved MDE, their BDI scores significantly decreased. Um, and this was shown in the statistical test that we ran. It's important to note, or interesting to note though, that it's not that the BDI scores are necessarily lower among those with the resolved MDE, but rather it's relative to the BDI score they had a year ago. Um, so this um, speaks to the within-person change being more important than the actual BDI score itself. We also looked at reliability, in particular test, retest, test retest and internal consistency, and found that these indices were both excellent. So we are confident that when we use the BDI scores, we are assessing depressive symptoms of error. We also applied another psychometric approach to look at um, how to best interpret BDI scores, and this is the RASH analysis. And with this, we found that suicidal ideation is the most severe item of the BDI. So um, broadly speaking, what the RASH analysis does is that it can order questionnaire items to reflect the least to most severe form of the condition being measured. So for example, if someone just has um, no depressive symptoms at all, but they get a little bit depressed, the symptom that we're most likely to see them endorse is work inhibition. And then with a more moderate level of depressive symptoms, they might then have irritability along with all of the symptoms that come before it. Um, and this ordering of symptoms may look different in different contexts, in different samples, um, such as in a general practice sample versus among college students, et cetera. And so um, that's why it's interesting to look at this and important before we use this scale in any context to look at this. Um, and so in our sample with the hotel study, we found that suicidal wishes was the most depressed symptom or it represents the most severe symptom on the BDI. Okay, uh, so with that, then we can look at who has these different BDI scores in our study. So we found that a wide range of BDI scores are present across psychiatric diagnoses. So in this figure here, we have the full sample, or we have the full sample first as the first bar, but then going down um, those different subgroups of those with different psychiatric diagnoses. And across, we can see the proportions of BDI scores that people with the different conditions have. So as expected, those with major depressive disorder and those with suicidal ideation have the highest proportions of moderate and severe levels of depressive symptoms. And um, those with the different types of disorders that are not those two have um, more minimal and mild. But that said, um, the other disorders that are listed here, they still have the full range of BDI scores. So that speaks to the comorbidity of depressive symptoms and potentially suicidal ideation among those with substance use disorders um, and other psychotic disorders and mood disorders as well. Mm -hmm. And we can also take a moment to look at the numbers of those with each of the different psychiatric disorders here. These the ones that were included in this figure are 
um, the ones that at least 5% of our sample have. I'd also like to note that for suicidal ideation here, we actually took that item out of the BDI when looking at their total scores and um, describing the proportion to remove collinearity or the two things measuring the same thing on the X and the Y axis. Okay. Um, beyond that, we also looked at the relationship between BDI scores and different demographic variables. And we found that BDI scores are higher in women and in younger individuals and in those with suicidal ideation, which I'm now um, denoting as SI. Um, so this figure here is a look at the age by BDI score. Can't see it super clearly here, but the statistics did show that women on average have higher BDI scores than men. And as folks age, their BDI scores um, get slightly lower. This figure is a descriptive look at gender and suicidal ideation and BDI scores. And we see here that those with suicidal ideation do indeed have much higher BDI scores than those without. That said, we weren't able to do a statistical test with this one since the number of women with suicidal ideation at baseline was only 14. So um, slightly underpowered, but um, still an informative figure to see the spread of data. Okay, when comparing BDI scores to different outcomes, we found that first high BDI scores are associated with lower quality of life. And that's these two panels here. So on the left, we see that higher BDI scores are associated with decreasing mental health component scores of a quality of life scale called the SF36. And over here is the relationship between BDI scores and the physical quality of life. Um, so the, there's a stronger association with the mental component quality of life, but nonetheless, physical health is also related to depressive symptoms. And then down here, we see that high BDI scores affect role functioning more severely in older individuals than younger ones. So that's represented by the darker blue for um, the men in the study and darker red for the women, um, the darker being an individual in the, or individuals in the 90th percentile of age. And we see this slope here that shows that higher BDI scores are associated with lower role, role functioning. Um, in both genders, whereas among those in the 10th percentile of age, um, the role functioning scores do not really change very much um, with BDI scores. Okay, so those were some of the initial cross-sectional analyses we did. Um, and now I want to uh, talk to you a little bit about the longitudinal look that we had um, for depressive symptom severity and suicidal ideation. Okay, so this is the schematic of the one-year longitudinal analysis that we did. So I'll orient you over here first to the purple area. So this is all the life experiences that we ask participants to recall at their baseline assessment, such as lifetime psychiatric disorder, lifetime trauma experiences, um, lifetime substance use, leading up to the baseline. After the baseline, um, Participants come in every month for questionnaires and um, interviews with our research assistant. And in this one year of analysis, there's 12 months that are included. Within each month, this is a zooming in look at each month, um, we looked at the relationships between our outcome variables and the explanatory variables. So first there's a concurrent analysis where the outcome is at the same time as the explanatory variable. So our outcome was depressive symptoms and suicidal ideation. And then the predictor variables we tested were psychopathology symptoms, so anxiety and psychosis, and then drug and substance use. Um, both of these and the BDI and Maudsley scores, the recall was one week, which is why the length of this band here um, is visit to minus one week. And then traumatic experiences were recalled for the past month um, since the last visit. For the time-lagged analysis, everything was the same except for substance use. 
Um, we asked people also to tell us how many days of use they used in the week prior to um, the BDI assessment. So that is why it is the so-called time lag. So this might help us understand or ask further questions regarding craving or withdrawal from assessments. Okay, um, before showing you some of the results, these are the rates of the lifetime psychiatric disorders of interest. Um, so the numbers are higher than at baseline. So lifetime MDD is about 30.5%, anxiety disorders also in the 30s, psychotic disorder was uh, experienced by more people up to 60%. And then these are the different substances that we captured in our study. So the highest rate was cocaine, followed by opioid dependence, and then alcohol, cannabis, and methamphetamine. Okay, so the, this is the concurrent and time-lagged substance use findings, and I'll walk through that. Um, the, overall, what we found was that alcohol, um, opioid use, and cocaine use predicted depressive symptom severity. So again, as a reminder, substances are assessed as zero to seven days of use in either the concurrent week of the outcome or in the week prior. So I denoted these with the different shapes of so a circle and a triangle. So over here, we see for each of the different substances, the odds ratio of um, the odds ratio for depressive symptom severity. Um, so from this, we can see that increased alcohol, non-prescribed opioid, cocaine, and meth use increase the odds that someone has a more severe depressive symptom state. And then prescribed opioids and cannabis have slightly lesser, actually they were not statistically significant, so in, um, uh, no effect on depressive symptom severity. And more or less the concurrent and prior um, substance use were very similar in the unadjusted models. In the adjusted models, only non-prescribed opioid use uh, in the current week increased the odds ratio for depressive symptom severity. And then alcohol, non-prescribed opioid use, and cocaine use in the week prior to BDI assessment increased the odds of higher depressive symptom severity. This is a look at the predictors of suicidal ideation in our studies. And we found that a history of psychotic disorder, higher anxiety levels, and higher BDI scores predict suicidal ideation. So over here in this figure, we see no lifetime psychotic di disorder on this side and those with lifetime psychotic disorder on the right side. So 60% of our participants here, 40% here. And then on the x-axis was the anxiety subscore of the Maudsley, and those with higher anxiety symptom severity um, had a higher probability of suicidal ideation. And the different colors are showing those who had a BDI score of less than 19 versus greater than or equal to 19 at that visit. And we show 19 here to visualize the difference as this is the threshold um, for moderate to severe levels of uh, depressive symptoms. We also found in our analysis that higher lifetime trauma also predicted suicidal ideation. Higher lifetime trauma indicates the number of traumatic experiences that one has had up until the baseline assessment. And interestingly, substance use was not a predictor of suicidal ideation. Hey, taking it a step further, we also looked at the relationship between SI, depressive symptoms, and bodily pain. And we found that higher BDI scores predict higher bodily pain, and that higher bodily pain then in turn increases the risk of suicidal ideation. So this is a figure here to, to demonstrate that trend with higher, higher BDI scores, so depressive symptom severity, people had um, higher, more severe levels of bodily pain. This is an inverse score that we use, which is why um, the slope is negative. 
And then we also found that the odds ratio of SI with lower bodily pain was 0.45. So those with less bodily pain had a lower odds of having suicidal ideation. There was also an interaction found in this analysis in wherein the risk of suicidal ideation was higher in older individuals compared to in younger individuals with bodily pain. Okay, so those are all the analyses I wanted to show. We'll go into summary and takeaways. So some key takeaways here from what we've learned so far are that high rates, that there are high rates of mortality and mental disorders in the downtown east side neighborhood. Um, that said, death due to suicide is uncommon in this population, or at least in our sample, based on the information that we've collected. Another takeaway is that high depressive symptom severity is strongly associated with the presence of suicidal ideation. High depressive symptom severity is associated with lower quality of life, poor role functioning, and greater bodily pain. And then finally, a risk of suicidal ideation increases with more severe depressive and anxiety symptoms, history of psychosis, and increased bodily pain. So of course, there's some opportunity for future directions. Um, we can explore additional risk factors for suicidal ideation, for example, medical comorbidities or housing instability. There's also an opportunity to look at protective factors of suicidal ideation, as that's one of the goals of the hotel study as well, to find out what's not working in terms of supporting this population, but also what's working. So we also have questionnaires and data about the social support and perceived social support that our participants um, experience in their day-to-day -day lives, and as well health services use. Um, so primary care use, hospital use, um, and other uh, clinical services use as well. And then of course, knowledge translation, which is something that we're doing concurrently um, as we continue to um, ask research questions. We're also doing the knowledge translation um, uh, at the same time. And others I'd like to hear from you as well. Um, if we uh, get to that part of the discussion. All right, so that concludes my talk. Thank you very much for listening. And uh, of course, I'd like to shout out all the people who contributed to this work and supported me as well. So my supervisor, Dr. Bill Honer, and some main collaborators, Dr. Andrea Jones, Dr. Sky Barbic, and my supervisory committee, the UBC MD PhD program, and of course, the rest of our hotel study team and participants as well. Okay, I can open it up for questions.